you will join me in your Bibles, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. This morning we will be looking at verses 16 through 23. I think one of the most important books to be published at least within the last 50 years for the church, many of you are familiar with it, it's called The Whole Christ by Dr. Sinclair Ferguson. The book is based on the controversy surrounding the publication of one uh, of another book that I believe is in the top three books that every Christian should read called The Marrow of Modern Divinity by Edward Fisher. Last year, it was the book of the months so at one point, so I know all of you have already read it. Um, and if you're new since then, it is available in our bookstore. I didn't get to give my pitch earlier, so there you go. But something we see in those books and books like them is it strikes at the right understanding and the balance between the law of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and the focus is making sure Christians don't have a half-learned Christ, but that we would know the whole Christ. And by that, what is meant is that we don't know just something about Christ, but we, but we do not understand the full truth about him or see the full implications of the gospel and coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And really, if you think about it, you'll realize that with the exception of the pastoral epistles that Paul writes in his, in his letters in the New Testament, he's addressing people, he's addressing churches that really have only half-learned Christ. They do not have, they do not understand the whole Christ. Now let me help you get a better sense of what I'm talking about. All of us know people who have a half-learned Christ. Perhaps we were there at one point ourselves, or perhaps some still are. But we all know people who believe things about Christ, and when we hear what those things are, we sort of scratch our heads and wonder how in the world they could have ever come to the conclusions they've reached. Now, unfortunately, many professing evangelicals are very gullible people. When it comes to hearing from someone with a strong personality, someone with well-polished rhetoric promising that they have a way to greater spiritual life, greater spiritual fullness. That is, of course, how it is that all of the charlatans stay on television and make mountains of money. People are gullible. So maybe their perception is that Christ is just sort of out there and while he's out there, he's doing miracles and he's healing people or he's raising people from the dead or he's making people rich or whatever. You know exactly what I'm talking about. But they have one aspect of Christ's nature, that he's fully God and that he works supernaturally. And they only know that part about him or they only focus on that aspect of who he is and then in the end, they build everything else about Christ around that and about their life and about their theology. They've only learned half of Christ, but they need the whole Christ. They have all kinds of religious language. They have all kinds of religious ideas. They may sound spiritual, but they're deeply erroneous. There are many false teachers who sound good. They are so convincing in so many ways. They are persuasive, they are alluring, but they're not preaching the whole Christ and that makes them deadly. And so we will see the Apostle Paul address this this morning. And as we come to this passage, I'm reminded of a story that Kent Hughes tells about a visit he took to Krakow, Poland. And in Krakow, there's a square at the center of the town, and it's bordered on one side by the massive spires of St. Mary's Church. And from the great steeple of St. Mary's, a bugle has been sounded every day for the last 700 years. The last note on the bugle is often muted and broken, as if some disaster has befallen the bugler. <laughs> 
This 700-year commemoration is in memory of a heroic trumpeter who one night summoned the people to defend their city against the hordes of invaders. And as he was sounding the last blast on his trumpet, an uh, an arrow from one of the invaders struck him and killed him. And so there's always the muffled note at the end. The Krakowians have never forgotten this heroic warning. And this is what the Apostle Paul is doing here. He is sounding the trumpet. He is writing heroically to warn Christians of what is going on in their midst so that they will be aware of a half-Christ. And more specifically, the half-Christ that is taught by the Gnostic false teachers that they're trying to bring into the church instead of the whole Christ that the church in Colossae knew and believed. So let's read part of Paul's warning in our text. Colossians 2, beginning in verse 16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and the worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you die to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Well, it may seem odd to say, but there is a very real sense in which the divine grace of God will always be a threat to human nature. Grace undermines our constant impulse, our gut-level desire as human beings to want to justify ourselves. Grace runs counter to human pride. And that impulse we all feel to boast about our own accomplishments. Grace requires that we defer all praise to God. We have nothing in ourselves to commend us to God. Grace undermines our best efforts at accomplishing a list of requirements and prohibitions that we can impose on ourselves and we can impose on others as the condition under which we gain acceptance from God. And so grace demands only one thing, that glory and honor and credit all be given to the Lord Jesus Christ for what he has done, not for what we have done. And instinctively, in our flesh, we hate that. Now it sounds odd, especially as Christians, because we are so often to give thanks to God for his grace. We are constantly thinking about God's grace, and we sing about God's grace, and and we're continuing to orient our lives, so we're living upon God's grace, and yet in our flesh we rebel against it. And not surprisingly, for us as believers, were it not for God's grace, we would continue in rebellion against his grace because we prefer to do it all on our own, even when we know we're going to fail in the end. But this is why the more faithfully and the more powerfully the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached accurately, the more prone some people are to venture into legalism. Once you declare that God has graciously provided everything we need in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, you can rest assured that fallen human nature will rise up and protest and try to sneak in somewhere a rule or a regulation that we, in our own strength, can fulfill 
or an observance or a ritual that we, without God's enabling power, can perform that will, in our minds, enhance our spiritual standing or gain some reward that will put God in our debt. And all of a sudden, he's going to owe us for something. It all seems so backwards, right? And in circular fashion, it reminds us yet again why we are in such a desperate need of God's grace. Because without it, we are so prone to assume that we don't. Well, the Colossians had heard and received by grace the gospel of grace. They had turned from self-reliance and prideful self-justification and their pagan religious practices to rest in the whole Christ. But along came this group of people called the Gnostics. Now, the Gnostics believed in self-salvation through spiritual knowledge or gnosis, hence the name Gnostic. They held that the material world was created by a, a lesser deity that desired to do evil to humans. And that true salvation came from transcending the physical realm by gaining secret knowledge of the divine. The Gnostics emphasized the importance of this inner mystical experience of God. Very mysterious. So the Gnostics showed up in Colossae and some of the believers were beginning to listen to them. And Paul warned them about three major areas where the Gnostics were trying to finagle their way into the people's lives. Those three areas are legalism, mysticism, and asceticism. So we're going to consider each of those areas. And the first we see in verses 16 and 17. And Paul shows us that Christ has fulfilled all that God required and set us free from an obligation to live legal lives. The first warning Paul is offering here is a warning with regard to two specific areas of legalism. The first is food and drink, and the second, days of the week or month or year. So food and drink and days. So first, with diets. All throughout the history of the church, there have been groups who have insisted that the way to remain faithful to God, if you want to be really spiritual, is that you maintain and observe the dietary laws, and specifically here, the dietary laws of the Old Covenant. Now, under the Old Covenant, God's people Israel were required to adhere to certain dietary restrictions because their foods, these specific foods, were declared uh, clean or unclean by God. Now, there were, in fact, many things that God made this distinction with. It wasn't just food. Many things that were clean, many things that were unclean. Now, because many of these things were considered unclean and later declared clean, we recognize that the thing itself wasn't the issue. Shellfish itself wasn't unclean because it was shellfish or because there's something wrong with shellfish. No, it was unclean because God said it was unclean and he was giving a picture of a principle that is to make a distinction between things unclean and clean as the people themselves were supposed to do in all manners of life. It was a teaching tool. There was a spiritual concept at play that was to be at work in the minds of the people of God as they made distinctions, to build their consciences and this importance of making a distinction. But, but how did Jesus address all of this during his ministry? Jesus said to the Pharisees who were pretending like they were super offended by Jesus' new eating habits in Mark chapter 7, verses 18 and 20. He said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? Since it enters not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled. Thus he declares all food clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. Remember also in Acts chapter 10, very famous passage of scripture, verses 10 through 16, the apostle Peter has a vision 
It says, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, the Apostle Paul has a lot to say about food. There are entire chapters in some of his letters dedicated almost entirely to this issue of food. He wrote in 1 Corinthians 8, 8, food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do eat and no better, or don't eat and no better off if we do. There are many statements we could look at in the New Testament. All of them are in agreement, in agreement, namely saying that all food and drink, all food and all drink are lawful. Now notice, I didn't say there aren't excesses to be aware of. There are. The Bible is consistently warning against gluttony and drunkenness. But dietary discipline in and of itself is not a sign of spiritual maturity. You aren't proving anything about your spirituality by being able to maintain a rigorous diet plan. There are plenty of really vain, self-obsessed people who hate God and are very disciplined in their diets. And yet... The Gnostics were coming in and trying to convince the Colossians that they had a need to maintain these dietary restrictions to remain from certain kinds of food and certain kinds of drink if they were going to be sufficiently spiritual and faithful, if they were going to have a meaningful relationship with God. The same thing continues to be propagated today among groups like the Seventh-day Adventists who restrict the types of food that their adherents can eat. And the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches have mandated fasts and restricted types of food that can only be eaten on specific days of the week and various seasons throughout the year. So evidently, the false teachers in Colossae were declaring that those who enjoyed their freedom in Christ to eat and drink within the parameters established in scripture, they stood condemned or were at the threshold of the loss of divine approval of some kind of similar pronouncement. And Paul comes in and he says, no, don't let them judge you. The bottom line is that it is not legalism to say that we need to exercise self-control and not be gluttonous, But it is legalism to dictate what anyone can or cannot eat. It is their prerogative. In like manner, it's not legalism to guard against drunkenness, but it is legalism to declare that it is wrong to drink alcohol or any other kind of drink. How we go about eating and drinking, yes, should reflect self-control and we should concern ourselves with taking care of our bodies that God has given to us, but what we eat and what we drink is of our own business to sort out before the Lord. If you want to be a vegan and be miserable, that's your choice. (laughs) Do you know how you know if someone's a vegan? They will tell you. I'm just kidding. Don't come at me. I don't want you to spend all the energy you have arguing with me. (laughs) I kid. (laughs) There's nothing about our diets that makes us more godly. And if you, if you don't want to drink wine or beer or liquor or soda or coffee, that is your choice to make. But none of the choices you make in that regard are going to inherently make you more godly or a more holy person. In like manner, Paul addresses similar ideas here with regard to days. Again, we see in the Old Covenant that there were numerous days that were to be honored. Sabbaths and festivals. Festivals. 
The Jews had special feast days. They had moon celebrations. They had Sabbaths. Jewish life was governed and patterned around certain days all throughout the year. In terms of feasts and festivals and new moon celebrations, they were each a remembrance of the work of God in some significant way, especially with regard to his work of rescue or redemption of his people. And so whether it was Passover or the Festival of Booths or Yom Kippur or Purim, there are many different festivals. All of these were pointing to some specific aspect of God's work and all of their purposes were fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. There were new moons. Every month when a new moon came, it was observed and it was, it was honored as a day to thank God for what we now consider another full month, give or take a few days. It was a sort of thanksgiving recognition. Now, he mentions Sabbaths here, and this may be a little bit more trickly, tricky because we automatically assume when we read that word that Paul is talking about the Decalogue and more specifically about the fourth commandment, but that is not what Paul is addressing. All throughout the Old Testament, you read about the Sabbath, which is what we see in the creation account of God as he establishes the seventh day in the Old Covenant as a day of rest, and then it is codified in uh, the Decalogue as a commandment from God that we too are to honor this day. We also, though, we also read about Sabbaths, plural which are specific days during each month when burnt offerings were offered up to the Lord. Now, interestingly, as these are referred to in the Old Testament, it's always, it's almost always at least, these three things mentioned together. Feasts, new moons, and Sabbaths. So there's something similar in each of these, namely that we have some kind of observance that is different. And in this instance, we, we want to recognize that it's especially different from the Sabbath, the Sabbath that we see in the Decalogue, in the fourth commandment. This is a text that people, uh, this Colossians text with regard to this issue of the Sabbath is a text that people often butcher out of context and say that the Lord does not require that we observe the Lord's day today. But to do so is to completely rip this from its place in the Bible and ignore a lot of other texts that give us exactly the places that we understand the Christian Sabbath, the Lord's Day, is on the first day of the week and to be honored in the fulfilling of the fourth commandment. But for our purposes here, like the food the false teachers were telling the Colossians that they also had to pattern their lives after the Old Covenant calendar in order to be sufficiently spiritual. But how does Paul respond? Well, he tells them that food and days were shadows of things yet to come. They were types of what would come and ultimately to be found and fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. The dietary rules sensitized God's people to purity. The great feasts and new moons and Sabbaths taught various aspects of God's word in creation and redemption. They were all shadows. The reality came in Jesus Christ. To continue to look at these things, to continue to look to diets and days as things that could provide spiritual benefit were to undermine the work of Christ. It reduced the work of Christ than being less than it actually was. And the notion that there's some kind of way to quantify our spirituality as if there was some kind of way to be able to tally up our works and provide us with greater spiritual standing provides an unfortunate basis for pride. And in any church, uh, or individual that holds to these ideas. And, and along with that pride comes judgmentalism toward those who don't, don't, don't do the same things in the same ways. When we are legal hearted, we judge others by our standard of our creation. 
And if they don't do things in the way we assume they're supposed to do them, to prove their faithfulness, to prove how spiritual they are, we assume they have compromised, and eventually we conclude maybe they're not even Christians at all. And what happens with our relationships in that instance? We stand at odds. We have enmity with one another. There's no way we can have legal hearts and still have profitable, life-giving, soul-stirring relationships with others. We will always be looking for others to fulfill our standards and to live upon our demands. And when they don't, we strike at them with the law because the law is unbending and rigid and strict. So one of these things you see, especially if an entire church is embracing legalism, is that you begin to see very stringent uniformity. The people all begin to dress the same. They all say the same things. They all use the same language. They all talk in the exact same terms. And so often, whoever their leader is, is treated with an unhealthy reverence. They insist on being referred to by their title. They demand respect. And the people often live in fear of disappointing him, as if he could never do anything wrong. And so legalism only breeds fear and enmity, and there's no alternative to this. There is no spiritual health where legalism is present. It's not possible because it it, it limits a person to self-righteousness and an attempt to live fully upon oneself instead of upon the finished work of Christ. And I want you to notice something. Notice that Paul says, do not let anyone judge you in these things, in verse 16. In other words, he's not saying don't have a special diet or special certain days or whatever. No, no. He is saying, if you want to do that, great. If you don't want to do that, fantastic. Do you want to celebrate Christmas? Go right ahead. You don't want to celebrate Christmas? No problem. Do you want to refrain from pork and shellfish? Fine. You're causing yourself needless suffering, but you can do that. By the way, there's this bacon-wrapped shrimp at Cooper's Hawk. They serve with guacamole. Incredible. I'll sneak out at lunch sometimes just to go get insane. So good. How could you not want that? You're causing needless suffering, but you can do that. Do you want to eat bacon all the time? Good on you. Do it. The best thing you could do for your health. And whatever you do or don't do, These things, these matters, they're up to you in Christ. You have that freedom. But you don't have the freedom to judge others when they do or don't do the same things. And Paul says, don't let others judge you in these matters. This is a warning to take to heart because time and time again, as legalism has come into the church, the church has become judgmental and very clearly it is joyless and it is uniform, and it is actually very shallow in faith. We are free in Christ, brothers and sisters. And so let us live and eat and drink and celebrate free from joyless, legal-hearted attempts to nail us down to regulations that God himself has not mandated for us. But Paul goes on. There's more to what's going on in Colossae. In verses 18 and 19, he shows us that mysticism is a lie that promises what it cannot deliver. From 1966 to 1968, Johnny Kerr was the head coach of the Chicago Bulls. And one time, Kerr told this story about how he was trying to help his team. They were in a bit of a slump. And he said, We had lost seven games in a row, and I decided to give a psychological pep talk before the game with the Celtics. I told Bob Boozer to go out and pretend he was the best scorer in basketball. I told Jerry Sloan to pretend he was the best defensive guard. I told Guy Rogers to pretend he could run an offense better than any other guard, and I told Eric Mueller to pretend he was the best at rebounding, shot-blocking, scoring center in the game. We lost the game by 17 points. 
I was pacing around the locker room afterwards, trying to figure out what to say when Mueller walked up, put his arm around me and said, don't worry about it, coach. Just pretend we won. (laughs) But you see, the Gnostics were pretending. They pretended they had this great spiritual insight, but it was all a hoax. It was all a mirage. It may be surprising that that anyone was falling for it, but they were, and still today, many do. You don't have to watch the TV preachers very long to see this nonsense. If you've ever been to any country in Africa, take your pick, the billboards, billboards line the streets with all of these mystical promises of deliverance and healing and miracles, you name it, the promise is there if you just have enough faith. It's the same nonsense. It comes back to the individual. If you're spiritual enough, if you think it enough, you will get it, you will receive it, it will all be yours. Do you want a baby? You will have a baby if you come to the prayer service and have enough faith. Do you want more money? Just give it to us and we will multiply what you have. Do you want to be taken over by the Holy Spirit? Just pray in tongues and have the pastor touch you with oil. It's never-ending nonsense, but people buy it up in droves and can't get enough of it. I've heard the most outlandish stories from people going into great details about what they have seen, what they have experienced. Some even writing books that become bestsellers about how they went to heaven and talked to Jesus and they've been dead for days. So they saw heaven and they came back to tell us a special message and they've done all kinds of things. And in the end, do you know what they're doing? They're making it all up. It's a lie. It's a lie. And these Gnostic false prognosticators feigned humility, pretending that they were super spiritual. They were wrapped up in the worship of angels. They were making claims like, we are not good enough ourselves to go directly to God, so we begin out with the angels, and if we come in the right spirit, we will elevate our requests through the hierarchy until we get to God. And so all they're really doing is worshiping angels. In like manner today, there are those who pray to the so-called saints or to Mary. And as much as they deny it, they are offering worship to them. We also see in the text that the Gnostics were claiming to have special visions. They were seeing things in their dreams or they were having special visions supposedly that gave them deeper knowledge or greater spiritual insight, deeper spiritual wisdom, and more profound religious experiences. And while they were pretending to be humble in all of this, Paul says, actually, they're very puffed up without reason, and they have a sensuous mind. To claim such super spirituality is the epitome of pride. It's all vanity. It was all a farce, but it's so enticing, isn't it? Think about how you've had times in your life where you just wanted to know. Maybe you just wanted to know the right thing to do in a certain situation, or you just wanted to know what decision to make, and there are several options, and any one of them might turn out well, but you just don't know, and you wish you could have a dream, or a vision, or a voice from heaven, or a visit from an angel, or a letter from the Apostle Paul in the mail. That's so enticing to the flesh, isn't it? That's why people can open psychic studios and do tarot card readings and palm readings and actually make money. Not because it's real or true, but because we all so desperately long to know more because we want it all laid out before us. But the reality is that we have, brothers and sisters, we have all that is necessary for life and godliness in the scriptures. And yet we want more. We beg for signs and wonders, and yet we have all that we need right before our eyes. We have an embarrassment of resources in the West. And so remember, the, remember when the, the Pharisees demanded a sign from Jesus to pr- prove that he was who he said he was, and he didn't do it? Why? Because they already had seen his miracles. They knew 
They knew what he did and what he could do, but they still did not believe. But we're not any better today. So the response of Jesus to those who saw his miracles is instructive. God will not do tricks for those who refuse to believe, let alone those who have hardened their hearts against him so much that they're only there to ridicule and antagonize. So Jesus told the Pharisees that they would get no sign from him. If what they had seen did not convince them, nothing would. The foundational problem is what Paul writes in verse 19, namely that the one who appeals to mysticism is not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. They aren't holding on to the whole Christ. They've only known a half Christ. So they want to demand from Christ something that Christ will not give them because they've not experienced the fullness of communion with him that he freely offers. Do you long for a sign from God? Do you think being a Christian is only really complete with some kind of radical spiritual experience and when you've truly believed, you're going to hear a voice from God or speak in tongues or be able to do miracles yourself? The Bible tells us there is something far greater than all of this. And it is in believing and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ alone who has revealed himself in the scriptures. Do you know what's amazing about the Bible? It's that we don't need to have mystical experiences because we have the sure, objective, true, inerrant, infallible word of God that makes mystical experiences completely unnecessary. We don't have to figure out if the voice we heard was from God or just our conscience or an upset stomach, whatever it is. We don't have to try to speak in tongues or talk to angels we have the sure and true word of God. It's a glorious gift, and so often the tendency is to think, well, it's just not enough. And if you think it's not enough, then surely you're not reading it and understanding it and storing it in your heart and living upon all that it gives to us. So Paul goes after legalism, but he also deals with this idea of mysticism, that it will never give you what you think it will. Look to God, look to Christ, build your life upon his word. There's nothing more sure, there's nothing more true. And then finally he turns to asceticism in verses 20 through 23. And he shows us that asceticism only appears to be holy but it's not. God has given us so many wonderful and good gifts in this world and the tendency sometimes is to reject them under the assumption that to accept them, to embrace them, to love them or to take part in them and, and, and to, to enjoy all of this is, is too enjoyable or it, we might like it too much or we're gonna maybe crack a smile every now and then and have a good time so we shouldn't do it. Sadly, there have been so many attempts throughout the history of the church to call evil what God has created as good for his own people to enjoy. And so instead of enjoying it, the tendency is to say, don't touch it, don't taste it, don't even look at it. So you name it, it has probably been rejected by some group. We've already looked at food and drink there are groups that even reject marriage as a good. They say that super spiritual people don't need to be married. So they can take the vows of chastity and the only thing that has produced is tragedy. There's often a rejection of sex as a gift and so it becomes a taboo subject. People won't even talk about it. It's something people refuse to admit that they, they enjoy or can delight in. And at best, it's viewed simply as, as something to be done for procreation. And it, it's opposed to 
a communing of souls for enjoyment and pleasure and delight as a gift that God has given for his people who have covenanted together in marital union. But this self-made religion does not do any good for anyone. In fact, it can heighten your fleshly temptations and along with it produce a joyless, defensive approach to life. There was an entire ascetic movement in the Middle Ages and the most popular of those who, who gave in to all of it were called the Desert Fathers. These were men who went out into the desert, they took vows of silence, and they lived in complete solitude doing all kinds of aesthetic practices. Some were spending their days even, they were balancing on top of really tall poles, like telephone poles, for hours or sometimes even days at a time, apparently to pr prove their spiritual devotion to God. Nothing shows you're devoted to God like balancing on a telephone pole. Others would starve themselves for weeks on end. Some would flagellate themselves with whips and chains and others would, would sleep on the floor or on a bed of nails. They walked on coals and scorpions and asps to prove their commitment to God's protection over them. The stories are numerous and none more appealing than the next, but it all became very popular. But again, I must remind us, this is not just a thing of the past. This is very much a thing that we see today and was very much a part of what Paul was warning the Colossians against. See it for what it really is. This is an expression of independence from God saying, I'm going to get to God on my own terms by my own might. Asceticism feeds the flesh by starving it. Does that make sense? The flesh is really built up and, and makes us feel like I'm actually doing something spiritual and holy and right and commendable to God because I'm starving myself, because I'm hurting myself. Look at me. Look at how much better I am than all of you who enjoy things in this life. But the answer, the answer to such delusion is in verse 20. We have died with Christ to the basic principles of this world. And our death in Christ has freed us from the elemental spirits of the world, the demonic powers of this world which promote and thrive on human asceticism. And because we died with Christ, they have no actual power over us so we can live in the full joy of God's creation, enjoying him, enjoying his people, enjoying the stuff that he has so graciously given us. Let's consider here four things that Paul points out as problematic with asceticism. He faults it on four counts very quickly. First, in verse 22, all the things that are being denounced are things that are perishable objects of the material world that perish as they are used. They're not lasting. They are not of any sustaining substance. Number two, such rules, again in verse 22, are according to human precepts and teachings. And isn't this the essence of every kind of legalism? The demand that others conform to your conscience in areas where God is silent or even approving. Number three, this approach only seems wise. Verse 23 says, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body. When you, when you look at someone so dedicated and disciplined in denying themselves the ordinary or free and enjoyable gifts of life, it is easy to be deceived by the appearance of spirituality. Such people look committed, they look pious, they look holy, but appearances can be deceiving. I've known Christians who have said they refuse to drive a nice car or live in a nice house or own a television or buy any brand new clothes all because they wanted to make it clear by outside appearances that they were really suffering for Christ as if it was a virtue. There's a great story about Charles Spurgeon, he was traveling to preach somewhere and he got off the train and another sort of antagonistic preacher who was, I think, probably jealous of Spurgeon had gotten off the train at the same time 
and he saw that Spurgeon was coming out of the first class car of the train and the man came and he said, Mr. Spurgeon, I travel in coach to save the Lord's money. And Spurgeon looked at him and said, well, I travel in first class to save the Lord's servant. (laughs) And this is the understanding that we see in the scriptures. Don't judge me because I'm riding here versus there. These are gifts that God has provided. You have no reason to judge what someone drives or where they live or what they wear. It's between them and the Lord as they provide according to what God has given them for themselves, for their family, for their brothers and sisters in Christ, and hopefully they're very generous toward the works of the gospel. Who are you to judge in those things? And in fact, to judge in those things might be a sign of spiritual immaturity when the assumption is that it makes you look more faithful. That's asceticism. And when articulated, it may sound spiritual, it may sound wise, but it's all very self-promoting and very deceptive. Finally, perhaps Paul's most important statement, notwithstanding the surface spirituality that religious activities produce, verse 23, they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Rules and prohibitions and self-denial that spring from man's own religious creativity are utterly ineffective in curbing the desires of the flesh. The flesh mocks any such attempt to inhibit its expression. Asceticism, in and of itself, won't help you keep in check your sinful urges or energizing the war with temptation. So what will the whole Christ? Knowing Christ, communing with Christ, believing all of Christ, enjoying Christ and his gifts... Do you know the whole Christ? Do you know that Christ, in looking upon all of humanity, saw that in and of ourselves, we have no hope of fulfilling what God requires? Be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. I have yet to meet a person who's told me they're perfect, even though they may reject the Lord. One of the most common statements we hear amongst humans today. Nobody's perfect. You're right, and that's a problem. We're all in desperate need of perfection because it's what God requires, according to his law, that we have perfection before him. But none of us do. And so Christ came into the world, and he lived a perfect life. He fulfilled the law of God perfectly, not one sin within him. Not any sins of thought, not any sins of intention, not any sins of deed. No sin in him. And what did he receive for it? We read it earlier. He received a death penalty. He was nailed to a cross and he died. Yes, he was brought there by Jews and Romans to be hung on a cross, but the text tells us it was as God designed. Why? That he would take upon himself the wrath of God that is due to all of us because we're not perfect. That's what we deserve. We deserve to die on a cross. We deserve to live in eternity in hell. But he took the wrath of God and he was buried in a grave, but the grave could not hold him Three days later, he was raised from the dead and he conquered sin and death forever. And so you, dear friend, if you do not know the whole Christ, you can put your faith and your trust in the perfect and whole Christ. You can believe in him and know that in doing so, that his perfection counts for you. His death, the penalty he paid for sin, counts for you. And so when you come before the Father, no longer will he say that you are guilty, but rather you are declared not guilty. My son, my daughter, my child, and you have the blessed privilege of calling him Abba, Father. Friend, will you know the whole Christ today?
I commend him to you. As you come to him by faith in humility, confessing your sin, he will not turn you away. He will not cast you out, but he will lovingly receive you and call you his own. Brothers and sisters, the answer to legalism is this continual realization of the grace of God in the glorious gospel that sets us free from having to live upon our own righteousness and it frees us to live upon Christ's righteousness instead. The answer to mysticism is an understanding of how profoundly we are related to Christ, not needing experiences to validate what we know is true from the word of God, not needing special spiritual knowledge or visions or dreams or miracles, but simply trusting the word of God alone. The answer to asceticism is the reckoning that we have died, we have been buried, and we are resurrected with Christ. So we need not abuse our bodies and suffer needlessly to prove that we are more than we actually are. We need not die to the good gifts that God has given us to prove our worth. We do need to die to ourselves to show that we know that Christ alone is worthy and the only one worthy in our lives that matters in the end. We need the whole Christ for the whole Christian life if we are to live a whole Christianity. May God help us. Amen, let's pray. Father, we are truly thankful for the whole Christ for the one who has lived and died and been buried and resurrected for us, that we need not live legal lives with legal hearts, that we need not depend on mystical experiences, that we need not beat our bodies and deny ourselves the good gifts that you have given to us freely with asceticism. Lord, help us to enjoy what you have provided that we would see beyond the gift to the giver and give thanks, that we would delight in the the many beautiful ways that you have blessed us as your people. Lord, we are thankful as Christians that we are yours. Help us never, Lord, to indulge the flesh in a way that leads us to be legal or mystical or ascetic. Help us to trust and believe in the whole Christ, knowing that your word is final, is true, and is reliable and sufficient in all things. And we pray you would do this for your glory and for the good of your church, in Jesus' name, amen.